Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, uh, honoured guests, uh, mayors, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, all of you, welcome this morning to Glasgow City Chambers and our banqueting hall, our subtle and understated uh, banqueting hall, um, the venue for this morning's very special event, uh, which we are extremely honoured and excited to host here in Glasgow. Uh, my name is Councillor Susan Aiken, uh, I am the leader of the city of Glasgow uh, and Glasgow um, is we are beyond privileged uh, to not only be the host city for COP26 this most crucial of climate summits on which the very future of humanity uh, could be determined um, it's not to overstate its importance to say that um, but we are also privileged that our city chambers here has become the world's city hall uh, for these couple of weeks and that we are hosting so many colleagues and friends from around the world and that I've been able to host so many fellow city leaders. I know that some of you have been here already um, and I've, uh, there's lots of faces here who I, I recognise, some of you I've met online um, over the past 18 months and I'm, I'm just able to meet in person now. Um, but to all of you, uh, whether it's your your first time here um, or not, uh, we send you the, the warmest of our famous Glasgow welcomes. Uh, this morning's event um, is very special. We're particularly privileged to have two of the world's, I think, most interesting thinkers and leading thinkers on not just climate, but climate and cities, um, climate and urban spaces. Um, I, they don't need much introduction from me, but just in case, um, I will introduce them. We have a uh, special envoy, Kerry, the first special envoy for climate change for the United States, and uh, former Secretary of State, Kerry, and I know will be well known to all of you, his, uh, his illustrious CV um, is too long for me to go through this morning, but as you all know, he was a United States Senator for almost 30 years, um, a Secretary of State, uh, and now the, the first ever uh, Special Envoy for Climate Change, and someone who has been absolutely instrumental in setting the tone for this particular COP. Um, I think that the first person that I heard um, on an international stage, on our news bulletins, talking about Glasgow and the importance of what is happening in this city right now was uh, former Secretary of State uh, Kerry, uh, when he talked about Glasgow being the, the, the last best chance for the world. Um, and, and he has been, as an individual, absolutely instrumental in helping the world to understand just how important um, and how crucial and how pivotal the discussions that are taking place down at the Blue Zone right now are for the future of our shared planet. Also joining us is uh, Lord Norman Foster, um, one of the most distinguished architects in the world with a list of projects uh, well known again to, to many of you. Um, the, the Gherkin in London, um, 30 St Mary's Axe to give it its Sunday name, um, and uh, the, um, the Olympic Stadium, uh, sorry, the um, apologies, Be in uh, Beijing, not the Olympic Stadium. Apologies, I've mislaid my notes. The most important uh, uh, venue that uh, Lord Foster has designed, though, um, it, it may not be the most important in other people's eyes, but it is definitely the most important for Glasgow, is our Clyde Auditorium, which is down um, in the Blue Zone. In fact, it is part of the what is usually the Scottish Events Campus um, and is known to every Glaswegian without fail as the Armadillo. Um, it was one of those 
uh, buildings that was a real signifier in Glasgow's renaissance, our, uh, the way that we have used culture and the arts in Glasgow to drive our recovery from the post-industrial era. It is enormously loved by Glaswegians. It's um, an, uh, one of the most distinctive elements of our modern skyline. Um, and we're very grateful to Lord Foster for making that unique contribution to Glasgow's um, urban space that, that we ha have now and share now. I'm not going to say very much more. We've got um, a packed agenda ahead of us. We've got many city leaders and mayors um, who are bursting to ask questions. And we're here this morning to listen to these two great thinkers and their contributions and thoughts um, about what uh, is happening in the world just now and what we can all do to address it. So I will take my seat. And we will And we're moving to the, yes, just taking that my lapel mic's working now, moving from one to the other. Um, so first of all, um, we're going to have a round of questions uh, between Lord Foster and Secretary Kerry uh, themselves. They're going to have a conversation and then we're going to move over to questions from mayors. So first of all, um, I'm going to give the floor to you, Lord Foster, to ask the first question <coughs> to Secretary Kerry. Secretary Kerry. For decades now, scientists and researchers have been ringing the alarm bells about global warming. And going back to 1992, there was the Framework Convention of the United Nations. And it brought together world leaders around the table to discuss climate change and how they would combat it. Now, 30 years later, your administration is saying we have a climate crisis. How did we, we get there? What was missed along the way? A lot. <laughs> um, can I begin by saying what a pleasure it is to be uh, here in this extraordinary building uh, with my friend, uh, Lord... Norman Foster on, on Martha's Vineyard, where we are neighbors. He's just Norman. Um, but um, it's a pleasure to be here with him very, very much. Uh, and, and you know his extraordinary accomplishments around the world. Uh, beautiful buildings, beautiful spaces. But more importantly, he contributes so uh, much to just the thinking about the place of a building and the importance of functionality and uh, the human component of whatever it is he's doing. So I'm always privileged to be with him, and it's nice to be here. Madam Mayor, thank you uh, for uh, doing this and making us available. Um, and I say a word about the C40, the mayors, if I may. I don't know how many mayors are here, but. You were heroic during that terrible dark age when Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement. And I remember standing up the day after that announcement in New York with uh, three governors, uh, Jerry Brown, Jay Inslee, and Andrew Cuomo, and we announced the We're Still In program. But you, the guys, you're the folks who stayed in. And that effort, together with governors, uh, across our country actually kept the United States relatively close to our target during the years that we were absent from the agreement. So 75% of the new electricity that came online, for instance, in the last three years before Joe Biden was in fact from renewables. So we didn't do as badly as we might have, and it's a testimony to the power and importance of grassroots, localized decision-making. And we can talk about that a little more in a while. Um, so Norman says, how do we get here with respect to the climate crisis? Well, I was, in, I was in Rio in 1992. And I was there when Jim Hansen testified to us in the Congress in 1988 uh, that climate change was happening. 
And a group of us in the U.S. Senate, with Al Gore, who I was with last night at an event, um, and some other senators, bipartisanly came together. And we were all in Rio because we were working with George H.W. Bush across the aisle, uh, bipartisanly to deal with the issue. But it was a voluntary agreement. That's what happened. It was a voluntary agreement. And as we all know, when there's a threat that's over the horizon and people can't and don't feel the daily impact and see the reality, it's so easy in public life to sort of shun it aside and uh, not to really take seriously the science and the realities. Uh, Al Gore wrote a terrific book, The Inconvenient Truth, based on that. And we were constantly talking about climate change and climate crisis, and people were laughing at us to a degree and dismissing it. Um, and as you all know, uh, some people chose to mock it and mock the language and mock the reality. But now they're not mocking, but they're kind of ducking for cover. They're not yet full enthusiasts, but they're not standing in the way completely the way they were, though they're standing in the way. Look at the fight President Biden is having to get his climate bill. What's pushing back? Special interests. Coal, fossil fuel. Uh, fossil fuel got $2.5 trillion of subsidies in the last five or six years. $440 billion last year. Are you kidding me? Fossil fuel got a subsidy? So we are subsidizing the problem we're trying to cure here in Glasgow? It doesn't make sense, folks. And it underscores the degree to which we human beings have an ability to engage in the absurd, to live out the complete denial of reality. And if you read the history of denial, it's long and brilliant. I mean, human beings have a great capacity for denial. And we engaged in massive, prolonged denial on this topic. And so now we're in a race against time. Uh, the next 10 years are indeed the crisis decade. And if you don't believe it, just take a look at what the scientists are telling us. This is not a matter of science, I mean a matter of ideology, it's not politics, it's mathematics and physics, that simple. And we know what's happening. And the scientists have warned us again and again over these 30 years. Most recently in the IPCC report of 2018 in which they said, you, meaning all of us who hold positions of responsibility, or our opinion leaders in society, have 12 years within which to make and implement the key decisions that avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. Well, Donald Trump chewed up three of those years, folks. And now we're at nine years. But here in Glasgow, I really do feel there is something different. I've been to cops from the very beginning. I mean, post Rio. I was in Kyoto when we made that decision. I managed that on the floor of the Senate where we couldn't move against the reality of people who were saying, well, we're not going to do this if China's not going to do this. I mean, just basic politics, right? Why should we hurt our economy if everybody else is going to be racing ahead? And so there was just this indifference to the real choices of responsible governance. And a lot of people lied, and some still are. So. Uh, this is a fight not just to deal with the climate crisis, this is a fight for truth and reality and for good governance and for responsibility. A lot of it has to do with responsibility. And it's a fight for a cleaner, safer, healthier life. Because after all, it is pollution that's croaking us here, folks. Pollution. And back in the 1970s, when I was, the uh, first thing I became engaged in when I returned from the war in Vietnam was Earth Day, 1970. And we had a citizen's movement, and the citizen's movement of Earth Day produced, within a year or so, Clean Air Act, 
Safe Drinking Water Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, Endangered Species Act, and we created the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States of America. And a Republican who was not particularly an environmentalist named Richard Nixon signed it into law. That's what happened. And that's the accountability factor we need to, to draw on coming out of Glasgow. And I'll tell you, uh, anybody in public life, you know, I'm in public life but not elected anymore. Um, uh, the uh, younger generation gets this, and, and they're just asking adults to behave like adults, and hopefully we will. That's how we got here. A bunch of adults turned their backs on reality and truth and better choices, and so that's where we are. I would ask you the same question. <laughs> no, seriously. I'd like it to be <laughs> I mean, you, look, 50% of the population of the world lives in cities, right? And there isn't a city I've been to in the last year or years where you just can't move. I mean, it's absolute gridlock. We have people spending three hours a day to drive to work, get from work, come back, and, and uh, get home, and everybody's in their car, and public transport in a lot of places is not particularly fun crammed in, jammed, and uncomfortable, and they don't run with the frequency you need, and so forth and so on. So my question to you is, how did city planners and designers and, and architects and everybody else, how did they let us get where we are today? Why are our cities, which are brilliant in so many ways, centers of arts and music and, and, and these little communities through the cities that have their own life, but it isn't as livable as it ought to be. How did we get there? I think we ignored the lessons of history. Um, the car probably from the 1950s or 60s encouraged sprawl. And in a way, the way you pose the question gives the answer. The cities which are the most desirable in every poll count, where people want to live, where they want to visit the tourist trail, they're all compact, dense, walkable, pedestrian-friendly cities. Um, those cities that sprawl lack social cohesion, and as you say, they're car dependent. I mean, if you take two cities, one, the compact city, say Copenhagen, the other, the sprawling city, Detroit. They have the same population, a very, very similar climate. Detroit is half the density of Copenhagen. It consumes 10 times the energy. So I think that, and it's not just designers, urban planners. Remember, going back to the 60s, um, take New York, you had Robert Moses, the politician, who was, uh, the, the future was the car. And you had Jane Jacobs, an activist, a citizen, and she mounted a campaign. He was gonna drive an expressway right through Greenwich Village, destroy all the neighborhoods, which is the vibrancy, traditionally. And she you know, brought together citizens and sanity prevailed. It's not that long ago that the future was the automobile. I think we're rediscovering, as you say, the benefits of, of traditional cities, the importance of the infrastructure, individual buildings. I'm an architect, but probably I'm more passionate as an urbanist about the DNA of a city. The, the infrastructure, if you think about the infrastructure, it's the urban glue that binds all the individual buildings together. It's the boulevards, the green spaces, the public spaces, the plazas, the bridge, the connections. That's what determines the quality of urban life. And that's where the investment should go. And if you think back to those historic cities, they pioneered, I mean, this is a great example, you know, of civic pride. Um, so those qualities of pride, we need to rediscover. And all the mayors here today, 
they have that leadership, that responsibility to continue that tradition of doing things well. Quality is not about money, it's about attitude of mind, how you spend precious resources wisely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. From, from the room there. I think there's been some uh, absolutely inspirational and incredibly important points made already. Um, Lord Foster, do you have another question for Secretary Kerry? I, I think that um, you know, we, we have mayors globally here in this room. So I think perhaps politically, um, uh, programmatically, uh, how do we encourage them to, uh, to sustain, to create more sustainable uh, cities, to reduce the carbon footprint? Um, do they partner with, uh, with the private sector, with citizens, with national governments? I think those are, those are burning issues. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think now, Norman, I think now, uh, Anybody in public life, I don't, at whatever level, frankly, has no choice if we're going to deal with the realities of what we face, but to partner with everyone. Yeah. All of the above. Absolutely. Uh, this, this is genuinely an all-out effort, folks. I mean, we have a... You, you know, what confounds me a little bit about it, I must say to you, is how, I mean, I just mentioned the subsidies, the illogical, counterintuitive, uh, almost uh, destructive, self-destructive path on which we are embarked, given what the options are. I mean, I voted, I was 28 years in the U.S. Senate before I became Secretary of State, and so I voted thousands of times. I forget what the number was when, we, when I left. It might have been double-digit thousands over 28 years. And, um, you know, sometimes you really agonized over a vote. And those of you that like, sometimes you agonize over a decision. You know, I gotta make this tough decision. There are pluses and minuses for citizens. Um, and, and I'm gonna pay a political price because I'm asking people to pay for it or to do something. Tough decisions. This is not tough. The decision about whether or not we're going to deal with the climate crisis or our cities and make them better and more livable is not a tough choice. It, it really is about building a cleaner, healthier, safer world in so many different ways. Um, I mean, we are talking about pollution. We lose 10 million people a year die from the quality of our air around the world. One of the biggest causes of children being hospitalized every summer in the United States is environmentally induced asthma. We spend about 50 billion a year on it. But we can try and get 50 billion for our cities for some initiative. We, we spent $265 billion just cleaning up after three storms three years ago in the United States. Maria, Harvey, and Irma. Irma, first hurricane to have sustained winds of 185 miles an hour for 24 hours. Harvey dropped more water around the Houston and Louisiana area in five days than goes over Niagara Falls in a whole year. And Maria destroyed Puerto Rico, and you saw the attitude of our president who threw paper towels at people and believed he was helping them, and they still don't have full power back. So we don't make, you know, we're just not making logical, real choices that um, benefit us. And um, the, the climate choice is really absolutely clear. Um, first of all, if we don't make the choice, we're going to have trillions of dollars of damage. We're already, if, we, if you accumulate, aggregate the damage we have today, I just talked about 265 billion, but that's just USA on three storms. I didn't include all the storms, I didn't go around the world. We're spending trillions of dollars already 
on sort of non-productive cleanup afterwards rather than prevent and be involved in legitimate adaptation, resilience efforts and, and mitigation. Because if you don't mitigate, you're going to be doing a lot more adaptation and building resilience, the, the absurd cycle we're in. So that's what Glasgow is all about. I mean, I've been to these other cops, as I mentioned earlier. This one has greater energy, more focus, and intensity that I have not felt in any of the other cops. And it has one other thing that is critical, and it pertains to Norman's question to me. Uh, who do you work with, et cetera? The private sector is at the table at this COP in a way that we've never had. And today, you're going to hear an announcement about banks and asset managers and asset owners who come together in the Glasgow Alliance for banking and for net asset owners, et cetera. We have about, I mean, somewhere in the vicinity of 120, 130 trillion dollars that is now saying we are focused on this and we're going to invest in this going forward in the transition. Now, not all of that money is going to just pour out and be done because we need bankable deals. But I've been working on this too. We, we, I've worked with our six largest banks in America. Uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, Wells Fargo, State Street, Bank of America, and J.P. Morgan. And they have committed publicly. They're going to invest $4.16 trillion as a floor over the next 10 years to accelerate the transition. So here we are, public sector working with the private sector, doing exactly what we need to do, which is aggregate and motivate and elevate and, 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 and accelerate this transition, uh, which is absolutely vital for us in this 10-year period. Now, we will leave Glasgow, and I, I hesitate, I mean, I shouldn't probably get excessively predictive here, but I'll go out on a slight limb. I think we're going to have the greatest increase in ambition we've ever had. We probably do just in these first, uh, you know, 36 hours. And uh, the real issue is going to be follow-up, working with them. What we're going to do, Norman, is uh, translate our team that's been working on raising ambition as we come to Glasgow to now taking that announced, committed ambition, and making sure it implements, that we do the things we've said. So, for instance, I've been to many countries in the last nine months, working with Mexico, with South Africa, with Saudi Arabia, with Brazil, uh, with uh, Indonesia, all of whom have raised their game and have made commitments that they're going to do one thing or another, net zero 2050, or 50% uh, deployment of renewables over the course of the next 10 years in the case of, of, um, of uh, uh, South Africa, Indonesia, um, Saudi Arabia too, as a matter of fact. Um, but is that really going to happen? How are we going to do that? So we have to go sit down with them and say, okay, South Africa, you've got all these coal-fired power plants. We've got to close them. And we know we've had these discussions. They know it. They say to you, well, how are we going to do that? We don't have the money. We can't afford to. How, what about the workers, the people who are the mining the coal for them? Or, uh, so we have to have a just transition. This will take massive coordination. But it's doable, absolutely doable. Uh, and, and I liken it often. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, for various reasons, I became a kind of student of World War II. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the collective way in which we just decided at the end of 1943, it was not clear the Allies would win the war. But Roosevelt and Churchill issued instructions and orders and came together. And mid-level people, Paul Kennedy at Yale University, historian, has written a book, which I love. It's a tiny little book, no big deal. But the message, and it's important, it's called Engineers of Victory. And the book lays out how mid-level decision makers made the decisions with the support of high level that resulted in choosing to do things that gave us the superiority in the air 
Example, Ford Motor Company turned Liberty Plant in Michigan into an airplane factory. And by the time you were into 1944, they were turning out one B-24 every hour from that plant because we concentrated our effort. We need to concentrate our effort now in the production of new supply chains for solar panels, for wind turbines. We need to accelerate, like the Manhattan Project, accelerate our research and development for green hydrogen, for battery storage. I mean, somewhere we are going to find technology adding to the rapidity with which we can do this. But not unless we make a greater effort to harness the brilliance of innovation and science and technology and the people who are the entrepreneurs and innovators will make that happen. That can happen. We have a Defense Production Act in the United States. We're allowed to, the president has invoked it in a couple of instances. So we can do these things, but not unless we make the decision to do them. This future that we're all querulous about is definable by, you know, it's not something that's out of reach. It's not pie in the sky. But it also won't happen on automatic pilot. We have to make, we have the capacity, we haven't yet exhibited the willpower. So that's what we have to do, bring everybody to the table. And I'm convinced we, we can get, I really believe we can get there. I'm not just saying that to you. I'm. I have a sense of confidence and optimism about this road we're now getting on here in Glasgow, and to wit, 65%, given what we've been doing in the last nine months, 65% of global GDP, Canada, Japan, South Korea, US, UK, EU, now, hopefully, with people making 50% promises, other countries joining, South Africa's one, are all actually implementing plans, real plans, that keep 1.5 degrees alive. They give us a 60% chance to keep 1.5 degrees alive. That's where we are with 65% of global GDP. That's unheard of. It was unheard of that the G20, when we were in Rome the other day, agreed all of them, there'll be no more finance externally of coal around the world. It's unheard of that we actually got every country to agree that now 1.5 is the, is the challenge, not just well below two degrees. So that's enormous progress, folks, but obviously if we have 65% in, we have 35% still out. And we can't do it without that 35%. If we don't reduce emissions enough between 2020 and 2030, 1.5 is gone. We blow through it. And net zero 2050 is also gone if we don't do enough 2020, 2030. So those are the stakes. And the only way I know to get there is to get every single country at the table agreeing. If you're a tiny nation, you still need to not repeat the mistakes that we made from the Industrial Revolution until today. And if you're not a tiny state, you're a developed nation, 20 nations equal 80% of all the emissions. Some of you may have heard of Willie Sutton, the bank robber, and he was asked, why do you rob banks? And he says, well, that's where the money is. Well, why do we need to get the 20 nations? Because that's where the emissions are. And if we bring them to the table in these next days, which we're trying to do, I've had 25 sessions with China, virtually. I went to China twice in the last months, and we're still holding out the hope we can negotiate and bring China to the table. Because China is three times the emissions of the United States, and we're number two. And China's currently got plans to build 260 gigawatts of coal-fired power. And if they do, Katie bar the door. So those are the stakes, folks. You got to bring everybody to the table, Norman. We don't get this done unless uh, we're all in. That's where it is. Mm. That, um, tempered optimism is perhaps what...
Tempered. Uh, Tempered uh, optimism. Do you I, have uh, another question for Lord Foster? I do. I have lots of questions for Lord Foster. <laughs> you know? um, well, let's let's take the, the the sort of coda to what I just was asked by you, which I think would be appropriate for people to hear, which is, okay, so we know the mistakes that they made, but is it just not repeating those mistakes? I don't think so. I think a lot more is probably needed for people who lead cities and, and the folks who are going to make our cities, improve our cities, and fix our cities, and take them to the next level. What, what's going to do that? What's needed to make that happen? What are the ingredients that architects and city planners and others have got to focus on? As you said quite rightly, the future of cities. Uh, 2050, two out of three will be living in a city, 56% now. Um, cities generate wealth. I mean, just uh, the GDP of New York is, is equal to Canada. The GDP of Osaka, a port city, is the same as Switzerland. So um, over many decades, I've worked with mayors and I've seen their power to, to change. Uh, and cities are the drivers of greenhouse gas emissions, consumers of power, as well as being creators of, of, of wealth. So um, they have the power to use foresight to design the cities of tomorrow today. You talked about 1943. The height of World War II. In 1943, London commissioned Abercrombie, Patrick Ab Abercrombie, to design the future of London. And that plan has kind of potato shaped elements. He anticipated the importance of neighborhoods. And now, 90% of Londoners are within a 15 minute walk of a high street the ideal sustainable neighborhood. Fast forward to today, the COVID pandemic has moved the mayor of Paris to talk about the concept of the 15 minute city, rediscovering that. And um, so I, I think that your analogies, for example, you, you, you talked about the, uh, about the 60s, the height of the Cold War. It was Kennedy, 1961, who at the height of the Cold War exhorted everybody to, to be galvanized by the putting a man on the moon. It was interesting that that was the birth of the Green Movement. 1968, you had Earthrise photographed by an astronaut on the Apollo 8 mission. 50 years later, 2018, he said, we went to the moon and we discovered the Earth. It was that vision of the Earth with the very, very fragile layer of atmosphere. The 60s was hugely influential on me. That's when I became a green architect. I was inspired by Rachel Carson, the silent spring, Bucky drawing attention to the fragility of the planet. This couldn't have happened without the space race. race without sync. So, so I think that the, uh, the power of, of using design, global warming is a design issue. We have the ability, we have the brains, we have the technology, um, and you, know, you and your colleagues are galvanizing everybody around the world. In that sense, you're the architect of change. Um, and, um, you know, Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you both. I mean, we've already heard this morning, um, galvanizing is a, a, a brilliant word for it, um, <laughs> such uh, thoughts about the, how the urgency of the moment that we face now and the genuine sense of urgency that has been instilled at this COP can be translated into practical delivery of sustainability solutions and how design gives us, and, and the design of cities and urban places gives us so many of those solutions and how it is in the hands of us mayors and city leaders 
to use our powers to drive that forward. So um, I will uh, go over now to some of the world's mayors that we have with us and uh, go first of all give the floor to Mayor Kostas Bakoyanis, uh, the Mayor of Athens. Uh, Mayor Bakoyanis. Thank you. Good morning to everyone and many thanks for your leadership and this inspired and insightful dialogue. Um, Secretary Kerry, as you said, uh, this COP is make or break. But there is growing concern, if not outright anxiety, that we will not meet our goals, especially when it comes to turning words into deeds. So in this context, do you believe that the new multilateralism that would actually allow cities to be part of shaping the future of the planet is important and do you believe it is feasible? And what, I didn't. I missed the last words. For some reason, it's hard to hear. Yes, it's hard to hear. It's a little Thank hard to hear. Please. Could you come up here and, if you look out at everybody, I could yeah. probably hear you better. So, the question <coughs> is, in this context, do you believe that a new multilateralism that would actually enable cities to play a role in shaping the future of the planet is a important and b feasible? And at a time of multiple crises, do you think that now is the time not only for national diplomacy, but also for city diplomacy? Many thanks. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, <coughs> well, I think that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think you need a new national, a new uh, multilateralism. Um, I think nationally, you, the latter part of your question, I mean, just the city can decide to do what you want to do. I mean, that's the brilliance of being a mayor. You've got this enormous local power, uh, and you can galvanize, to use that word, on a very personal basis, corner for corner, street for street. Um, it's one of the best parts of our democracies. Uh, the, the city-state, I mean, the city is, is a brilliant concept historically. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, uh, I, was, I worked very closely as lieutenant governor of the state of Massachusetts for a while, two years only. But during that time, I forged an incredibly close relationship with the mayors, because the mayors were all right where the heartbeat of politics are, and, and they know what's happening better than anybody else. So I think that, um, uh, and, and being lieutenant governor, by the way, is not the greatest job in the world, just so you know. Calvin Coolidge was lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, and he was at a dinner party once, a man of very few words. And he was, he was asked by the woman next to him, he said, oh, you know, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm Cal Coolidge, I'm lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. And she said, well, wow, that sounds great. Tell me all about the job. And he said, I just did. <laughs> so, a different thing. I think, uh, <clears throat> I do not think you need a multilateralism, though it would help. If we have governors and if we have presidents and prime ministers and finance ministers who are really tapped in to the vitality of cities and the criticality now of doing what Norman was talking about, you know, defining this future. And, and reconnecting people, uh, it will be helped by multilateralism, <clears throat> but I don't think it's essential. So uh, I think the key uh, will be in terms of sort of what the multilateral offering can be is the recognition of what Norman talked about, which is the the the. Um, Funding, the bringing, convening, if you will, of mayors to try to get a master plan. I think that would be helpful. To have an approach where you can cross state lines or national lines and unify people because everybody's going to be helped by the efforts of other people in this endeavor. So, not, you know, you can do it on your own. 
but you will be much more empowered if you are getting the national, international, global commitment to do this, and if there's a greater momentum to do it. So I'd just, I'd come at it with, with all, in all ways, frankly. Uh, each city should probably have its own vision of what are the characteristics that they want to emphasize in that city, or what are the, you know, what are the best aspects of the culture of the city, or the different cultures of the city. I mean, in New York, obviously, you know, Boston, my city, um, you know, we have these incredible uh, diaspora enclaves that give great vitality to the city. I mean, how many people say, I want to go to Chinatown and eat tonight or enjoy, you know, or you go to the German town up in, uh, in, in New York or the Bowery or wherever. All these places are defined by these special characteristics. So I think you want to find ways to be able to augment that, which will never be done by the national multilateral piece. That's local. That's really the heartbeat of cities in many ways. But you need money. You need national coordination on things like transportation uh, and uh, certainly on pandemics and emergency assistance and all these other things. So it's a real mix, I guess. I don't think it's either or, one or the other. It's going to be a la carte. Uh, and the key is to have the mayor there who has that vision, who wants to do those things and who is particularly ready to be as inclusive as you conceivably can be, which, after all, makes for really good politics, too. So that's the way I'd look at it. Lord Foster, the diplomacy of cities, what are your thoughts? Cities learn from each other. And um, I think there's a very interesting overlap between the pandemic and the climate crisis. Um, uh, it's forced us to reassess the balance between the global and the local. It's made us aware of the benefits of globalization and the importance on the big issues of pooling resources, thinking globally on issues of health, of climate change, but at the same time getting a better balance with the local in terms of supply chains, um, and, um, and perhaps, as I think about it, um, historically, cities have always benefited from crises. They've always bounced back better. Um, you know, if we think about the DNA of London, the brick terraces, we don't think the Great Fire of London, which brought in building codes and created fireproof construction. When we go on the Thames Embankment <clears throat> and we look at the Thames itself, we don't think it was cholera that created that, that created modern sanitation in London, or the reservoir in Central Park was a response in New York to, uh, to cholera. And so I think that it's magnified trends that were all ready there. The, 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 the pandemic. Um, but I think that we've also seen uh, the reduction in traffic. We saw as in London during the pandemic a 70% improvement in the quality of air. Um, and, um, and I think we're seeing the way in which technology has enabled people to carry on business without actually physically traveling. But at the same time, it's made us aware of the importance of face-to-face. -face. You couldn't do what you're doing in terms of unifying nations in this endeavor against fossil fuel if you weren't physically there. You, you, you wouldn't be effective doing it by Zoom. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's uh, up to a point, yes, but um, so I think it's, it's brought us back to an, an awareness of, of that balance between the global and the local. Can I just add one thing to, to, to the answer? I was thinking further about it. The, 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 it really helps if you have a national government uh, that is prepared to make the city a big deal. The funding is critical, obviously. I mean, we've had efforts like that at the national level in the United States, depending on who the president is. 
Um, but we've had great initiatives for cities at times. And I remember even, I was a prosecutor for a while in Massachusetts. I ran the largest, one of the largest district attorney's offices, and it was miserable when I came in. It was an old county office, couldn't work, had 12,000 backlog cases, didn't deliver justice, blah, blah, blah. And um, the federal government put together something called the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, LEAA, and we were able to apply for grants. And I remember I applied like crazy, and we got half that office funding came from the federal government, but we were independent to do what we wanted, so we started a rape counseling unit, a victim witness you know, assistance unit, and a priority prosecution unit. We delivered, and, but they didn't meddle with us. They gave us the ability to do it. It is damn helpful if you could do that for the cities themselves. And we had those programs where we've had <laughs> major funding coming from the federal government to the cities, and they've been able to redesign, rebuild. The problem is, a lot of that happened during a period when we were not thinking the way we are today creatively about what the city ought to be, so they built highways through the city, or they did, you know, some really crazy things. Remember 1960s urban redevelopment was tearing down communities, and, and some of those communities just lost the heart. I mean, I... I, I <clears throat> drove through communities in Massachusetts where these beautiful, gorgeous, Victorian, turn-of-the-century buildings had all been torn down. One side of the street was drop-dead, picturesque, you know, gorgeous, and the other side was a strip mall, flat, horrible, ugly. And, and so how you do it is obviously critical, but you need funds to do a lot of that. <coughs> I hate to say this, I've got to run shortly because we are uh, announcing the Oceans Conference in Palau, and, and I need to run and, uh, you know, perform that responsibility if I can. So I don't know how long we are. I think you know, I am getting the, the, the uh, yeah. <coughs> if you, um, He's what we call the hook. <laughs> If you just um, let us know when you have to, you uh, when you have to go, Secretary Kerry. Um, and we've already heard so much. I think it, the, of what you've said resonates both of you resonates incredibly strongly with Glasgow. And I know that other city leaders uh, will will feel that immediate sense of recognition in what you're talking about as well. Um, I'd like to invite um, Mayor Yvonne Aki Sawyer of Freetown to ask her question. Um, Yes. Norman, right? before, you, before you do that, um, Mayor Aki Sawyer, uh, we're just going to give our um, sincere thanks to Secretary Kerry for your time this morning. I know that um, you, you have to go and do what you're here to do, which is uh, bring countries together at COP26 and get the agreement that the world needs. So thank you very much. I it's been it's an so honour. I'm leaving you with Sir Norman Foster. <laughs> we, we still have Sir Norman. Thank you. Don't worry about that. Oh, don't do it. No, nobody even noticed. <laughs> In our schedule, and we, um, although we've we've lost Secretary Kerry to um, to the demands of world diplomacy, uh, we we've still got city diplomacy here in this room, um, and uh, the insights of Lord Foster uh, to respond to your questions. So, um, with apologies for the interruption, Mayor Aki Sawyer, would you like to ask your question? Thank you very much, um, Lord Foster. In your earlier remarks, you made mention actually already of the COVID pandemic and some of the changes that we saw. 
um, changes with emissions during that period, the slowdown. But what I'd like to ask is, how do you think that COVID has actually impacted not just the operations and what we saw happen, but really the politics of the climate change debate at the global level? Um, and from the perspective of planning, the environment... I'll start again. <laughs> so, Lord Foster, I was just saying that in your remarks earlier, you mentioned the fact that COVID, that during the COVID outbreak, we saw changes in the way people lived and the way things were done. You mentioned the supply chain and so forth. What I wanted to think, ask you what your thoughts are on how the COVID pandemic has actually changed, potentially changed, has it, has it not, the politics of climate change at the global level. And then when you come now to the local level, whether you feel that there's an environmental and spatial approach which may be impacted. We've heard about the 15-minute city, um, and we see the 15-minute city in operation, but to what extent will this be coming through in order for cities to accelerate um, the post-COVID just green recovery? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that um, that cities bounce back better from crises. And that, I believe, is the, is the lesson of, of history. Um, so COVID, like any crisis or pandemic, magnifies and accelerates trends that were already there. But I think there's one interesting exception to that. Um, if I, pedestrianization, the way in which uh, citizens have embraced positive change in the hearts of cities. Roads were taken over by outdoor dining. People were strolling. If I think back to one project many, many years ago, uh, Trafalgar Square, and that was closing one side of Trafalgar Square to avoid it being a traffic roundabout. That project took seven years. 180 institutions were consulted. There were 15,000 petitions, questionnaires. That effect happened in weeks and days in the heart of the, of the pandemic. Suddenly, everybody was excited about the potential of greening the city, of making it more, more walkable, more, more, more friendly. So I think attitude of mind has, has changed. Uh, that, I think, is, 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 is really important. It's brought people together. And I think we've realized the prospect of, of making the city of the future greener, quieter, safer, um, more equitable. Thank you. Uh, Governing Mayor Raymond Johansson of Oslo, would you like to ask you a question? You have the floor. Yep, thank you. This uh, will be about just transition. Uh, in Oslo, we are using a climate budget as a governance instrument, which is very important for us, to mainstream the climate action into all our decisions and city planning. And for us, it's crucial to build support for climate policies also among the working class people in the outskirts of the city, because we see that the green shift cannot be just for the well-educated middle class. You have to find ways to get the traditional working class on board. 
So uh, how will you see to build these necessary bridges in reality on the day-to-day -day policy and uh, build the support for climate action among working class people, which I think it's instrumental for so many of us. Very simple question, isn't it? Um, I think your, um, the way you phrase the question, the working class, the outskirts, um, links to the last question about the pandemic and change. The one, th the one important thing about the pandemic, it made us really aware and appreciative of those people who make the city work. The nurses, the security, the fire, the shop assistants, um, a new appreciation of the poorly paid, your working classes, and you talk about them being on the outskirts, and they're having to commute in, to leave early in the morning, to make the city work, because the center of the city is unaffordable. When I was a student, some of the best housing in London was a, a civic initiative. It was created by the civic authorities, and, and, and it created high quality housing, affordable housing. So first of all, we have to level out the city. We have to make the outskirts, which are poor, we have to inject, <coughs> regenerate. And a lot of that is about intelligence. It's using the power of zoning to be able to convert obsolescent buildings into new uses, recycling. And at the same time, and I think some of the changes in terms of traffic patterns, um, we, we have to make the center of the city more equitable for everybody. So if you had those who ran the city not having to commute, which is unsustainable because it's guzzling gas, unless you've got good public transport, and often many of those poorer quarters are not well connected to the, to the city center. So I think the, the answer to your question is one of balancing equality. So you can relax the zoning to make uh, areas which in past regimes where the thinking has been, that's the cultural quarter, that's the living quarter, um, you have to go back to the more traditional city of the past, which was a richer mix of different classes. You didn't have this kind of ghetto of the, of, of the poor. So you use the power of legislation and incentives. Um, and for example, the, the idea of buildings generating energy from solar. Um, I worked with politicians in Switzerland and they asked whether there could be a solar prize in my name and whether I would work with them. At the beginning, buildings were just having the odd solar panel. This is going back 30 years now when this initiative started. Um, adding a little bit of energy. Now, every year, we have buildings which are gen generating three times the amount of energy that they need and diverting the excess energy back into the, into the national grid. You can do that because politically they've allowed that to happen. There are countries where you can't do that. The legislation doesn't allow it to happen because, as John was saying earlier, there is a vested interest and subsidies and discouragement. Um, so you use the power of legislation to balance out the city so that then you don't pose the question because the poor are not out there driving in, they're in the, in, in, in the center. And those office buildings which are 
relics from the past which need replacing by healthier buildings. A greener building is now scientifically proven to improve people's performance, to be healthier. Um, so you can recycle the old obsolete office buildings into residential, but you need the power of zoning, and you have that power uh, as mayors and politicians. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, if you don't mind, uh, my fellow city leaders to exercise a wee bit of discipline and keep your questions as short as possible so that we can get to as many of you um, as we can in the time that we've got available. So I'm going to hand the floor now to Mayor Latoya Cantrell, uh, the Mayor of New Orleans. Um, Mayor Cantrell. Have we got you? I can't see for the lights. There you are. So thank you, Susan. Uh, very quickly, you know, speaking of climate disasters, uh, you know, both the cost of the damages as well as adaptation efforts is a subject that concerns more than 70% of the cities in the world, including my own. Uh, just quickly give you an example. Uh, in my city of Des Moines, in a matter of three years, we had four 500-year flood events. Then in 2018, we had 10 inches of rain in three hours. And just last year, we had a new word that I learned, a derecho, which was 130 mile an hour uh, straight line winds across our whole state that uh, did billions of dollars worth of disaster. So just to ask you, so my, my question is, how do we make the adaptation ad agenda in design and discussion more powerful in the climate negotiations and more importantly, how do we find adequate funding to prepare our cities for these events moving forward? Thank you. And th that was, of course, Mayor Cowney of Des Moines. <laughs> so apologies, uh, Mayor Cowney. Um, we uh, um, had, had a mix up in the personnel there. But... Uh, yeah, <laughs> but they, they, sh they, should know, but they should know who you are. Frank. So that was uh, Mayor Cowney. Um, Lord Foster. <laughs> I think your question at the heart is about resilience. How do you make cities more resilient? Um, and how does that relate to, to funding? Um, I think by a combination of design and political ingenuity, to be able to harness the private sector and the public sector. So um, <clears throat> if I think about uh, examples at extreme uh, ends of the, of the scale, um, I had a region of, of France where a village, a town, <clears throat> called Mio, and the whole region, every summer, was locked in five-hour traffic backups, congestion, which was wreaking havoc environmentally, economically. So the region and the town is, is depressed. And by a combination of local and government initiative, um, competition was set up to bypass, to connect two main auto routes across this very, very beautiful <coughs> area. And the idea was a competition amongst uh, contractors to build the tallest roadway in the world, a viaduct, across this beautiful valley and streamline the flow of traffic and take that environmentally out of the, the region. So first of all, there's an acknowledgement that this is one of the most beautiful areas in France. So it's environmentally sensitive. So they do a mandate that the teams that will compete 
have to have environmentally conscious architects as well as engineers. And the bridge is an engineering uh, feat. Um, and then in exchange for the rights to be able to use toll charges, that's how this initiative is, 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 is financed. Um, and how do you measure environmentally the benefits of that? Truck drivers have to record their movements and they can compare the record of their movements before this viaduct was built and implemented. And they can then do the same measurements after the viaduct so they can quantify the time changed. And that comes down to something like 40,000 tons of carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere, the equivalent of 40,000 trees of forest over 40 years. So that's the environmental benefits of this initiative. Of course, there were critics. They were saying this is going to deface the landscape. By the combined talents of everybody involved, the engineers, the contractors, the designers, this has turned out to be so spectacular that people go to the region to look at the bridge. And they, in one year after its completion, there were 180 planning applications, many of them for hotels, boarding houses. So there's been an incredible economic benefit to the region. That's at the mega scale of a region. So that is combining political ingenuity, the pursuit of quality, and environmental, and harnessing the power of government and private enterprise. If I come down to a tiny example, a village in Switzerland, 800 people, and like so many in North America, in the Dairy Belt, in Italy, in Spain, you have the problem of declining rural because farming has become much more mechanized. Younger generations don't see a future in agriculture. You've got the growth of big agri-industry. You've got the demise of local shopping uh, because you've got big supermarkets which You've got the private car instead of the, 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 the railroad. So how do you reverse that, that trend? Again, at this level of a village, I'm involved in a project where it now has, everything is voted on in, in Switzerland. So an idea developed, which interestingly was sparked by a local, witnessing a workshop of different skills in my foundation in Madrid. And <clears throat> they had an idea, and that gave it an impetus, the idea of creating a third place. Now, this is before COVID. And the proposition was that the tech industries based in cities, could be Tel Aviv or it could be a local one like, like Zuri, um, that the future was going to be people working some of the time at home and some of the time in the office or the factory. Um, but they could see the potential for a third place that you might go to a beautiful, area of the countryside, you might encourage local sports pursuits, you could combine that with residential, you could bring local shopkeepers. So we've called it a hub. Um, and as I say, that has had now the support of almost 90% voting for it. So the local authority is providing the land. Uh, and in exchange for changing the zoning, 
this hub, this third place, will bring a working visitor. I mean, just at the, <clears throat> as, a, as a practice, we're not a tech industry, but as a practice, a, a studio of architects, we go away for every year, some days at a time, to brainstorm. We use hotels. They're imperfect. This would be absolutely perfect. And just the very idea of that hub, before it's been built, has changed the attitude to that village. So people, um, you know, a local bakery which was fragmented decided it would bring all its operations there. Somebody's already opened a, a boarding house. So you're, you're starting to see renewed prosperity. So I think it, it is using the political skills and again, harnessing the uh, private industry and individuals and enterprises. Thank you. Um, I know we do have with us um, Secretary General Abdullah Mohammed Al Basti of Dubai. Um, Secretary General, the floor is yours. Good morning. One of the biggest barriers that the city faces for the implementation of the bank, they are relying on targets on the bank, our financial. So, what are your thoughts on how city could better access climate finance or leverage private uh, investment in green finance? How can cities better access climate finance or leverage private investments in climate finance? Uh, <clears throat> I think the, the question overlaps with, with earlier ones. Um, uh, I think by, uh, by inspirational examples, by encouraging competition, um, by the pursuit of of higher standards and, and quality. Uh, the, many of the uh, standards that can rate a building environmentally, like LEED and BRIAM, um, are to be encouraged. They're about the in, in many ways, the wellness of the building environmentally in terms of its impact on the planet. You've now got a new range of ratings which are about wellness, so they're about the health of those who use the building. Um, what we're realizing now is that none of these ratings assess the embedded carbon in the materials that make the building. At the same time, they are not factoring in the operational carbon. <clears throat> in other words, the building itself is part of a wider sequence which involves transport, movement, operating, and eventually decommissioning. So, in that sense, we have to take a much broader, wider look. But coming down more specifically to the question in terms of a of a city and how can it encourage greener policies? The answer is holistic design with everybody who's involved in it. So it's breaking down the silos within a city. A very perhaps obvious example is waste and energy. If you've got one part of a city administration looking at waste and waste management, <clears throat> and you've got a separate silo that's looking at energy, you miss the opportunity of converting the waste into, <clears throat> into energy. 
So I think the answer is holistic design, breaking down the barriers between the different segments who are responsible for running the city and finding <coughs> ways of integrating and in the process of integrating, making the city greener, more sustainable, <coughs> with economic advantages and social advantages. Thank you, Lord Foster. I, I'm sure you agree. I think I could certainly sit here and listen to you talk about this all day. Unfortunately, time is not our friend. Um, so my apologies to uh, Mayor Gallego and, and Coutts and uh, Mayor Kurtz. Um, for not being able to get to your questions, but I hope uh, you agree that the opportunity to hear Lord Foster and previously Secretary Kerry expand on their ideas um, in such a, an open way has been absolutely invaluable. Can I ask you colleagues to um, join me in giving our warmest thanks to Lord Foster for his time and his insights this morning? Thank you. We did start uh, slightly late, about 10 minutes late, because Secretary Kerry was delayed. Um, so we'll move to the final part of our programme now, and it gives me enormous pleasure to hand over to the co-chair of C40 Cities, um, Mayor Claudia Lopez Hernandez of Bogota, uh, to give us some insights. Thank you very much, Mayor Lopez Hernandez. Thank you so much to everyone. We are here, uh, we were able to commit 1,049 local governments. That's the largest commitment ever in a COP. And we came here with our own resources. We're hoping the world, the private sector, the global corporations, the national governments will be able to match the investments that our people and our taxpayers and our local governments are already doing for this commitment. 
I want to bring a, a perspective that I can, I can um, um, not live without asking and without making this point. Half of the population is, uh, is woman people, woman persons in our cities. Particularly in the global south, half of the cities, as you know, have been built informally through community-based processes and organizations. Half of our economy in the global south is an informal economy, it's informal jobs. So people don't have pension funds or health insurance, but it's rather the unpaid care work of women who actually make cities and families feasible. But this is not a rosy picture for women. It means the poverty of women is the social security of informality in half of the world, in half of the cities, and for half of our, the population. So building not only clean public transportation systems, but caring centers in which we can institutionalize the care of those that women care for child care, disabled people care, elders care. We need to bring these services closer to the public stations transportation system, for example. Building proximity, building a healthier density to provide jobs, to provide places to care, to provide places to socialize, to provide places to garden together. Uh, instead of building avenues, building green corridors so that we can redistribute the space for the more, not only affordable, but cleaner forms of transportation. Let me give you a figure in Bogota, which is a city that you know. Private car, fossil fuels, car travels, are just 14 to 15 percent of travels per day in a city such as Bogota. But they occupy 85 percent of the space. That's not only not very equitable, but that's unsustainable. So redistributing public space for pedestrians, for socialization, for restaurants, for cultural purposes, is part of building a greener city and an inclusive city. All these ideas waste to energy, green corridors, public gardeners, um, open campuses to educate the youth people who needs more inclusive and better education and jobs opportunities. That's a huge demand that we face in all our cities. And making this good city, healthier city, greener city, affordable for everybody so that they cannot and they don't need to expend an hour or an hour and a half daily going from where they live to where they work or where they live to where they study or to simply encounter and socialize with others. But instead of that, having a proximity of 15 to 30 minutes around the city. Those are the cities that we are trying to build around the globe. And we cannot be more grateful for you and your inspiration and your support and all the people who work together with the C40s forum uh, to ensure that we achieve the goals that the world is trying to achieve for 2050. Maybe that's too late. Maybe it's 2030 and the SDGs and the climate change goals should match together uh, so that we can build greener, caring, innovative and inclusive cities for all. So, Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, Susan, you have been such a wonderful host these days. And dear Norman Foster, you're gonna have a lot of requests of advice from our dear mayors to make these cities work. Thank you so much to everybody. I think we need to move yeah. on and finish. Very good. Um, be great if you could.
Um, thank you, Claudia. That, that was wonderful. Um, and uh, a, a great summary of uh, the inspirational words that we've heard from Lord Foster. Um, that just remains for me, colleagues, to um, slightly belatedly, but we could not uh, miss her out, hand over to the uh, Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of UNECE, uh, Ms. Olga Algoirova. Apologies, Olga. <laughs> I was close. I was, I've been practising as well. Um, who has been a great friend to the city of Glasgow. Um, thank you very much, Olga. Thank you, thank you, dear Susan Aitken, honourable leader of the Glasgow. Is not on. <laughs> Is it okay now? <laughs> Okay, maybe I can start. Oh, it's working now. Thank you. So, dear Susan Aitken, Honourable Leader of the Glasgow City Council, dear Lord Foster, distinguished mayors, uh, it's really, it was really my pleasure to listen to this great discussion, and it's very difficult to, to, to say something more. But the topic of discussion today was uh, post-COVID city. So, and here I want to say some numbers that we all know. Uh, today, globally, we have 56% uh, of population living in the cities, and uh, it will be growing up to 68% uh, till 2050, what will add another 2.5 billion people living in the cities globally. So the, the mostly urbanized regions are North America, then Latin America, Pacific, and then comes Europe. Uh, the, the growth in coming years will be in Africa uh, and Asia. So it gives us some, some idea uh, about the city of tomorrow. Uh, I'm proud and honored to lead up one of the five regional commissions of the United Nations, what is the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, covering 56 countries, uh, starting from North America, then uh, Europe, Commonwealth of uh, independent states, uh, Balkan, the Balkans, Caucasus, and Central Asia. So quite many cities in the region, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we are working with them, and I will mention in a while. Uh, so, Lord Forster, you are shaping the cities for many years, decades. And uh, exactly you mentioned today uh, that we you already see, you have the vision how the city of tomorrow, and you have the vision already today. You were speaking about the greening, uh, some areas uh, that, was, that was and is important during the post-COVID and in-COVID times. Uh, I would like to mention here we had one pledge, it's called the Trees in Cities Challenge, and I warmly invite you to, to to plant the trees and uh, let us know because uh, we make some evidence on that. Special Envoy and uh, Secretary, Mr. John Kerry, uh, is ideally positioned to connect international, national and local. You know? And uh, this is very important when you mayors, you mayors are and at the forefront of the COVID response, of the climate change response, and implementation of Agenda 2030. You really are positioned to take the real actions. Speaking about Agenda 2030, I speak about SDG 11, what is sustainable cities, and SDG 13, what is uh, the climate action, why we are here today. And by the way, uh, I wanted to mention, we came here to the COP26 uh, with we call it trifecta. These are the three most important actions. And first is high or superior performing buildings. What has something to do with the cities, with the architects, with constructors? Uh, second, and I hear uh, that yesterday just 100 countries joined our call to decreasing methane emissions because methane might be more dangerous than CO2 itself. And uh, last but not least one is uh, management, uh, 
sustainable management of natural resources, including circular economy. Again, I hear a big role for the cities and mayor cities. But if I to hand it over to you, and uh, we can have a discussion. So before I thank to all our partners for organizing this event today, what is the Glasgow City Council, the Norman Foster Foundation, our Center of Excellence at Glasgow Urban Lab, the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Mission to the United Nations in Geneva, as well as uh, representatives of the Cities Network, C4 Cities, who organized this event together with us. And uh, my special thanks go to Mr. Youssef Elke from the U.S. Mission in Geneva for his engagement and his commitment to this uh, event. And of course, uh, I am and we are all especially grateful to Lord Forster for making this event happen and being with us for already a longer time uh, because indeed you were with us during our last Forum of Mayors and I would like to invite all of you uh, warmly to our second formal indeed because the first one was informal it was like a pilot project three years ago second forum of mayors that will take place on uh, 4th and 5th of April 2022 in Geneva. Uh, the forum of mayors will help to empower local governments to address the key challenges uh, of our time to bringing together city leaders from all our region. It means again Europe, North America, Central Asia, Caucasus. So the event uh, will prov provide a platform for mayor mayors from ho all our region. Uh, beyond to exchange of information on experiences, best practices on city level policies. So, and uh, today there was a question on multilateralism. Our form of mayors is really multilateralism in practice. And uh, UNEC is in some way a pioneer in this regard. And we hope this model from our region will expand also to other regions. So, Thank you again to all of you for coming either in person or joining us uh, at the live stream and uh, enjoy your stay in Glasgow. Thank you. Colleagues, thank you very much, um, everyone, for joining in this event today. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Um, please, uh, if you wish, go and get another tea or coffee. And could I ask, I know a few people have had to leave, but could I ask my remaining fellow mayors and city leaders, uh, if you are able to, to join us on the stage for a quick family photo with uh, Lord Foster. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. It was, it was so good. These, the timing of these things is never...